Okay, what's a healthy nationalism? We'll look at this today. Uh, so full disclosure, I am British. My family are Irish. I've lived in about six other countries. There's a lot of, lot of love for a lot of cultures. Um, even though my genetics, we could say are Irish. When I do those tests, I'm British. That's all there is to it. So what is a healthy nationalism? To my cynical, decadent, degenerate, postmodern scum friends, of which I have many, mwah, love to you. They would say there's no such thing they tend to see any kind of nationalism as uh, xenophobic, jingoistic, negative, particularly in Europe, Americans, but less so. But think about Europe. What happened is nationalism went to the nth degree, First World War, Second World War. <laughs> That's taking it too far, kids. Um, yeah, so there isn't really a sense of healthy nationalism in Europe, except on, you know, in a very small number of people. So what would be unhealthy nationalism? Let's um, define that. And then we can, in the video, I'll lay out what's a healthy nationalism, why you might want to have that as well. Actually, let me start with the why. It's part of you. You are part of a tribe. You may be like me, part of two or three tribes. You may have different parts of that, but a healthy sense of that. Otherwise, you're self-hating. You're self-hating, yeah? We are tribal creatures. This is not all of us. I'll come back to that. It's part of us. So how would you take that too far? Well, if you were said, look, my group are always the best, and I don't know why, but they are, and we're so good, we should dominate everyone else and maybe kill them off. That's taking it too far. Um, actually, that's the norm in human history. If you read human history, even like the Old Testament even, it's, and then we invaded them and killed them and we took all the women and children as slaves. That's not like slaves for the women, just because of YouTube. I won't go into that a bit further. Killed everybody else. And, um, you know, that was normal. They didn't even, you didn't even regard other people as human. Um, you'll still see this in some cultures, like, you know, like Orthodox Jews were called non-Jews Goy. It's Ferenj in Ethiopia. A similar word, actually, in Thai. Uh, Japanese, of course, will have Gaijin. It's, it's the impl implication is you're not one of us, but you're not really human. You're not fully human. And that was the norm. Even in Greece, they had the ancient city states. And then the idea of Greece actually came a bit later than most people think. And then they went, OK, we're Greek, but the Persians aren't really human. And gradually we've expanded that sense of who counts as being human, which is a good thing. That is a good thing. Uh, the West, by the way, led the fucking charge with that. The whole human rights thing. That's a Western concept. The idea of the equal before God. This is why the West got rid of slavery first. This is why we're the first culture in human history to get rid of slavery. I, I think of our primary culture as Western and nationalities as underneath that. Okay, so in ancient times, it's called things like Christendom, you know, we can call it that now, but similar idea. There's a transnational culture. Um, and of course, it's sophisticated in a way because you need to think of this in layers, right? It's like, on the most enlightened level, we're everything. One with the universe, right? I've had those states where you look at a rock and you know you're the rock. Yeah, we're, we're wondrous oceanic states. On the most spiritual level, we can identify as everything that exists. On the most human level, we're all human. Me, you, guy in Ethiopia, guy in Japan, whatever. We're all human, that's true. Human rights, the uh, sanctity of the individual, of this one before, one before God in the kind of Western tradition, yeah? Beautiful. And we're individuals, right? So I'm Mark, I'm not just in a tribe. You know, I have a personality different from that group. And I'm part of a culture, the West and UK and Ireland underneath that. Um, those cultures aren't infinite, even if, you know, your mum's Nigerian and, you know, you're Japanese and you grew up in Peru, still only three, yeah? I don't know anyone that's really realistic that it's more than three or four. Most of us is one or two, one or two these days. A lot, a lot these days it's a couple because of the moving around people tend to do now. Um, so everything I say about your nation, it could be nations, kind of like a couple. Yeah, This may be a geographical region, but it, ultimately a nation is a group of people. It is a group of people, not a line on the map. That's a mistake people make. It, it's not just a group of people, though. It's a culture. It's a way of doing things. It's a being at ease with your tribe. Some people object to the word tribe. They say it's just for Native Americans, bugger off. It's a perfectly good word for the rest of us too. There are Scottish and Irish tribes. Um, taking it too far would be then the xenophobia, the saying, 
my group, my country over all others, not really for any good reason, right? Just because, and I don't know any better, yeah? England. Um, so what's a healthy nationalism is understanding through travel, through study, through meeting interesting people from around the world and perhaps sleeping with some of them, I do recommend that, um, different people having interactions and going, you know what? We don't in Britain have the best culture around, I don't know, food compared to the Italians. We just don't, okay? However, we've got a really good sense of humour. And you know what? There's a lot of famous British writers, same with the Irish. You know, we we are the nation that produced Wordsworth, Keats and Shakespeare, yeah, Dickens, etc. Uh, we have a lot of creativity in the UK. You know, a lot of great bands, a lot of great comedy comes from the UK. The Americans recognise that. Um, our verbal banter in the UK is very strong, very strong. And it's not to say that these things couldn't exist in other countries. There are other countries with great writers, Japan, for example. Um, but knowing some of the strengths of your culture, you know, and it's on a subtle level, it's the sort of felt sense of your culture and being able to rest into that. And, you know, I spent a lot of time in other countries and I've had some great experiences, but there's something about being in, in the UK where I'm just like, on the land, resting into that, there's an ease, there's an ease. It might not have the exoticism that is attractive, but there's a deep ease to it. And I think if we don't recognise that, we miss out on something. There's a way in which people that try and be, you know, I'm a citizen of the world, people will say. Now, I've learnt languages, I've married someone from Ukraine, I've lived all over the world, I've taught all over the world, 50 countries at least by now, probably more actually. And um, I would never say I'm a citizen of the world because... I don't speak all the languages and I don't know all the cultures equally. It's a very arrogant thing to say, yeah? I mean, you can say I'm a citizen of the world and I'm a citizen of the UK, okay? So being part of a nation, it's not just a passport, it, it has meaning. And I think we need to make it mean something again, make it mean something again. There is such a thing as British values, I actually teach them in school still, actually. All hope is not totally lost in the UK. Um, all the things we talk about on this channel, like the rule of law, for example, that's one that kids are taught in school. Uh, that isn't the case in certain other countries where it would be, uh, I don't know, Islamic religious rule or just sort of power, might is right, Afghanistan, whatever. Rule of law, big deal. Yeah. So our, na our nation is one way of looking. It's kind of like Russian dolls, you know, individual, uh, the town you're in, you know, from the west of England, okay, I'm in a particular part of the country, then I'm in a country, then I'm in Europe, then I'm in the west, then I'm a citizen of the world, then I'm a citizen of the universe. All of those things are true, yeah? We do need to identify all those levels. If you just identify the level of the nation, you miss the individual, you miss the bigger sort of spiritual connection to all the other human beings on the planet, which is really important. But if you deny the nation, if you deny healthy nationalism, for me, in that, in that sense, you're a form of self-hatred. You're denying part of yourself. I just don't buy it when people push it away. They say they're citizens of the world, they don't relate to it. It's profoundly ungrateful. It's profoundly ungrateful to the people that have, you know, we're standing on the shoulders of generations. You know, I'm going around the English countryside today, beautiful day, summer's day. With my friend Roma, she's part of Sri Lankan, which she would agree with me, I think, on all of this, though. It doesn't matter if your genetics are partially from elsewhere, you can still be of a tribe, you know? It's not about ethnicity, it's about culture. It's about what you fully embrace. And we were talking about, like, we are talking this topic and saying, you know what, if we move to Japan and we fully embrace that, yeah, we could be part of a Japanese nation. Well, I think it is important that we stand for it. The West generally and within that are nations and we indoctrinate people into that. It's a strong word and it's, uh, I think it's the right word, indoctrinate. Um, of course, to learn the language, of course, to learn the culture. I remember there's a group of Italians sort of shouting in my gym and I, I don't think they've been in Brighton for long. I used to live in Brighton. I just said, listen, guys, in England, we don't do that. You know, it was nice to them. It wasn't an arsehole. I was like, I love your exuberance. I love your Italianness." your loudness, but that's not how we do things around here. Just a little bit more contained. This is England, guys. And they took it well. They took it well because they were visitors. They understood as guests. They needed to understand the local culture. And I uh, think this is important. This is very important. We don't deny. Yeah, we don't deny 
that part of ourself and we do stand for it. We do say, hey, this is important. This is how things are around here. Of course, not everyone has to abide by every tiny little thing, drinking high tea with your pinky out or whatever. Things are more complex and more interesting in many ways than that now. But um, I think we should be a stand for our culture, to have a healthy nationalism, to educate people who are visiting, who are coming to live here, that, hey, this is our culture, welcome, this is how we do things. This is what you've got to learn, guys. Yeah? Not anything goes. See, the thing with cultures is it's set multicultural sounds like a nice idea, doesn't it? I like different cultures. I like sushi. I like curry. It's all good, isn't it? Well, cultures by definition are sets of values. They're sets of values. What is good, what is bad, what I should do, what I shouldn't do. Let me give you a strong example now. We're past the 10 minute mark for YouTube. Uh, in Afghanistan, place I have been, um, it's normal to rape boys. It's a normal part of the culture. Not a big deal. Um, people laugh about it. So it's caused a lot of friction with the British military and local military uh, when the British were stationed there. Because the British military said, this is wrong. This is not okay. And they said, well, it's our culture. And their country, you might say, well, it is their culture. So, do you want that kind of multiculturalism in London or Paris or New York? I don't. I, I really don't. I don't give a fuck if it's someone's culture. Cultures, by definition, are a set of norms and values. So by definition... By definition, just by definition of the word culture, if we acknowledge culture is a thing and it exists and it includes values, we're saying our own culture not only is good, but is better, is better. Now, I fully expect someone from another culture to say their culture is better. And a sophisticated person will be able to defend that and say, well, this is better at this, this and this. This is why the West is great. Yeah. And it doesn't mean we can't admire things from other culture. If I look around my room, there's something from Jewish culture, there's something from Italy, there's a Buddhist thing up there, there's another Jewish thing from a colleague of mine, that's Japanese. It's literally, these are the things I've got in my room, you can't see them, but things I'm pointing at, pictures and statues and things. Lots to admire. You know, I've lived in, a lot of the people who are multicultural have actually lived abroad. <laughs> like I have, I've learned cultures, I've learned languages. <laughs> Lots to admire. But coming back to your own and saying, you know what? This is the one I really value, if I'm being honest. This is really, I just want people to be honest about it. It's like, be honest, you do love your culture. You don't have to be convinced of it. You know, I was actually, I was talking to a British Pakistani guy in a taxi not long ago, a week ago. And he was saying that he loves the green of England. He grew up here, his parents weren't from here, but he grew up here. He was saying he loves the green of England, driving through the green fields of the West of England. And you could see that he had that love of England in him. You know, it was very natural for him. No one had to tell him to do that. It's what he grew up with, you know, the green fields of England. And, it, you know, it might feel different to someone who hasn't lived here for many, many generations. But I think there's still uh, a lot of possibility there. A lot of possibility. So too much nationalism looks like racism, xenophobia, xenophobia, jingoism. Um, not appreciating the individual or the sense we're all human above that. Not enough nationalism looks like self-hatred, looks like cynicism, looks like not understanding the values that you do, if you're honest, hold dear. We all hold them dear. Take that Afghan example, pretty much anyone in the UK will go, that's disgusting. It's not okay. It's not okay. So um, yeah, let's be honest about that. Let's celebrate who we are. Oh, let me tell you a little story before I wrap this up. So um, a lot of talk like Germany, and the Germans are rightly cautious of nationalism. Um, they've seen the bad places that can go, seen the bad places that can go, but they've, they're always taught to have a sense of guilt and shame. Now, for things they haven't done, right? So maybe their grandparents, like every German child is taking to museums to sort of see the atrocities of Nazis. That's very noble, the Germans would do that. It's very smart, they would do that. It's very admirable that they would have the courage and the humility to do that. The Japanese haven't done that for their crimes in World War II. So credit to the Germans for doing that. But maybe they took it a bit far. And instead of saying, hey, Nazis are bad, fascism is bad. Instead of saying, very anti-Western, by the way. Um, instead of saying these things are bad. And maybe our grandparents screwed up majorly and that's not okay. Instead of doing that, they said it's not it's, it's the, the message a lot of kids got was it's not OK to be German. And that existed for a long time. And then Germany won a football championship. When was this? About 
10, 15 years ago now, it was a European Championship, I think. And I was teaching over there and all these kids were waving German flags, right? And everyone was super uncomfortable. But because the kids had sort of hadn't got quite so much indoctrinated, quite so much sort of guilt, they were like, look, we're just proud of Germany and we've reunited Germany. This is after the Berlin Wall fell and German values. They're waving their flags. And it was about football. And it just was really wholesome and normal and nice. And I was with my friend and she was so uncomfortable. And I was like, you've got to drop that. You drop, got to let the little kid wave his flag because they won the football. It's not a problem. Yeah? So, yeah, I understand where the caution comes from. You know, I've been to Holocaust museums in Israel, uh, been to um, Auschwitz in Poland, been to a lot of places that will make you cry, that are pretty, you know, where you see where nationalism can go too far. However... That doesn't mean we should utterly abandon the concept of some pride in where we're from, some sense of tribal identity, which we have anyway. We can't get out of it. You can't get out of it. Yeah. So let's own that. Let's have the healthy side of it. Otherwise, it just pushes it underground and it comes out in these shadowy kind of ways, as, as the Germans found out. So they shouldn't be pushing it down again. You've got to have it in a healthy way, healthy way own it anyways my ramblings on healthy nationalism hopefully something was helpful there uh what do you love about your country put it in the comments you know i remember saying this on facebook what do you love about your country a couple of years ago so what do you love about being british and so many of my friends came up with these cynical replies like slavery or this or empire you know, colonialism i said what about shakespeare what about the beatles what about our fucking sense of humor what about roast dinner on a sunday at a british country pub like i had today it's a beautiful experience green fields of England so much we could say so um put the cynicism aside what are you proud of